This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Misfits of Science, Episodes 2 and 3. Wait a minute, you know a guy whose work looks like this? Exactly like this. I didn't know he worked on paper, I thought it was just walls and buses. Wait a minute, this guy's an expert on Mayan art? (laughs) Mayan? Are you kidding? This guy's a 16-year-old dropout. Gloria. This is a Mayan map. It's over a thousand years old. Oh, wait, wait, a, wait a minute. Maybe we want to know about this guy. Maybe we don't. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast whose signal is going to get us all nuked. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? Here's a line I liked in the these two episodes where the one character said to the other character, is she looking a little cabbage patch to you? Yeah, uh, weird <laughs> episode, eh, with that yeah. subplot? Well, what I liked about it is it's like... It's kind of two dated references. One, just the way of talking about a woman possibly being pregnant. And then the second thing, a reference to Cabbage Patch uh, Kids. This is, I'm shocked how reference heavy and how reference contemporary heavy it is. (laughs) It's a, it's a, it's an odd little show. They're, they're really pulling from a lot of like current pop culture all the time. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch this today, you'd assume it was just all nostalgia based. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, it it almost it's right on that line of like, um, like yeah, if you watch like a parody of a show from this time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you know, Stranger Things. Or straight. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> anyway, before we get into it, Jordan, I wanted to talk a little bit about the cast, and so to do that, I made a little cast matching game for you. Your oh, okay. One of your one of your inventions, I think. All right, sure. I don't remember, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll play along. It's where it's where you match the actor to the role. Oh yeah, okay. In a different show they were in, but I've also I've also got some little trivia about the actors and to give it a little more a little detail on everybody involved. All right, let's do it. Well, really quickly, I'll just run down the actors for you so you know who we're talking about. We've got Dean Paul Martin playing Dr. Billy Hayes. Mm -hmm. And did you know, Jordan, that Dean Paul Martin is the son of the Rat Pack's Dean Martin? Yeah, I I only knew it because I saw the same little bit of uh, info in his bio, which is, I mean, it makes sense. There's like people who are celebrities, usually their kids are like, well, I guess I'll also try to be a celebrity. Which which child do you think he is since he's named after his father? Which which uh, what number do you think he is? I think he's I bet he's the second son. He's the fifth child. Wow. So by the fifth time, he's like, all right, I don't know, me. Me. It's me. It's... <laughs> um, in addition to being an actor during this period, he was also an officer in the California Air National Guard and flew jets. Oh, wow. Yeah, he had a, he had a really, I think he tried music for a while. And I, I believe at some point he also played uh, semi-professional tennis. He had quite a quite a few interests going on. He's the second actor that we've had that's been a professional tennis player. It was a big deal at the time, I think. <laughs> it's it's apparently an easier avenue than you'd imagine. Unfortunately, though, Jordan, this show comes out in 1985, and Dean Paul Martin dies in 1987 when his F-4 jet crashes in a snowstorm. Mm-hmm, pretty sad. So they wouldn't have made it to season three. It, it was, uh, unfortunately, trouble ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, the Another actor in the show, of course, is Kevin Peter Hall. Mm-hmm. Who's playing Dr. Elvin Lincoln. Who we mentioned as being a gigantic tall person in other movies. Absolutely. And here's a little trivia for you, Jordan. He, in fact, did play basketball both in college and professionally in Venezuela. <laughs> so he had to really he had to really act in that first episode to pretend he didn't know how to play basketball. Yeah, that's what I kept thinking, too. I was like, man, they're really stealing his thunder or something he's actually quite good at. <laughs> And to uh, keep the string of tragedies associated with the show going, he died in 1991 from an AIDS-related pneumonia after contracting HIV from a blood transfusion after he had a car accident. Hey, that's. I don't know why that seems. I don't know why that seems worse than the plane crash. I mean, both are bad, but I don't know that. I guess that's so unintended. I mean, it's an very unfortunate way to get a disease and then a long suffering disease at that. So it's just uh, it seems quite tragic. And also, like only a few years later, it's like both of these leads. It was rough on both of them. Mm. I can't wait to see what other members of the cast died horrible deaths. 
Well, the next the next cast member is Mark Thomas Miller. Johnny B. Johnny B. Do you, I love that all three of the male leads have three names. <laughs> You it was only... like that time in the late 90s where all the, the female stars, you had your Jennifer Love Hewitt, your Sarah Michelle Gellar. I guess so. This was the Maybe... precursor to that. That's right. It goes in waves, like boy bands. Um, his uh, career was a little short-lived um, because oh, in, no. in 1991, he was in a disfiguring accident that kind of stalled out his career and he kind of left acting behind. Oh, what, like his face got all mangled? I never been, I didn't, couldn't find any like clarity around what it was, but I, I think something must have happened. I don't know if it... I. I have a feeling it wasn't totally mangled, but I don't know. Like all, all the sources were just like one quote being like he was disfigured and he just like quit acting for a bit. So I'm not yeah. sure if it was just like he got a scar or if it was a, you know a lot worse. But uh, another tragedy for the show. Well, I have to say, yeah, this is so far the saddest. Where are they now? That I've heard in a while. Yeah, I was as I was thinking these actors. I'm like, oh man, this show did not help anyone out at all. With the sole exception of the next cast member. I was just about to say, um, if this puts anything in perspective, um, it must really be uh, 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 tough on those people who have, you know, been disfigured and such to be like, and next, Courtney Cox, who became a billionaire. Yeah, so, well, that's my only known on Courtney Cox is very famous. <laughs> Friends, uh, Scream franchise, that uh, that Bruce, uh, Bruce Springsteen music video. Milf Town. M- Milf, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, Cougar Town. Cougar, Cougar Town, Town, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Meltdown. That's a different show. Uh, next up on our cast list is Jennifer Holmes, who played probation officer Jane Miller. Mm-hmm. I have literally no trivia about her. She just acted in a bunch of work. Yeah, and I would argue uh, the worst role in this show. Oh, uh, easily, easily. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, we haven't seen him, or we haven't talked about him yet. We have seen him because we've watched these episodes. But the new cast member that was I added know. after the pilot, Max Wright playing Dick Stetmeyer. Now, I like this actor, and he's been in lots of stuff, kind of playing... He was typecast as this kind of nervous, uh, nervous kind of character who's always a little bit stressed out. And I know his what happened in his life, and it's also sad. Well, he's best known of, for, of course, as the father, Willie Tanner on Elf. Yeah. A show he referred to as hard work and very grim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just the idea of, like, uh, week in and week out of acting with a puppet. I mean, it's I, I love every story. I'm sure these are all famously to everyone already, but I just love his stories from behind the scenes, especially like that on the last shot of the last episode. He just walks off set and just never returns. Like, he doesn't say goodbye to anybody. He's just like, <laughs> done. Yeah. Do, do we talk about what happened to him, though? I don't know what happened to him. I didn't see um, anything. It's... He basically, uh, this is, I won't get into some of the, the more seedy details, but eventually he got into uh, like hardcore drugs and was like homeless and he ended up dying from complications from his lifestyle. Like it's a, it's a horribly sad story of oh, like dear. someone who was like a sitcom star. Oh dear. I, I didn't dig that far into yeah. his career because I thought he did okay. <laughs> He did not. He, he did, did not. not do okay. Well, well he, right after, I think he won like a Tony or something like he was doing well. And then I don't know, his life took a turn a la dean paul martin not to trivialize all the tragedies in the show but uh should we say it's the curse of mrs of science <laughs> i think it is yeah it's the curse of mrs of science except for the female lead they're fine they weren't fine. yeah yeah the curse only affects the male chromosome all right jordan so you've heard the actors now and it's okay if you don't remember their names you know who their characters are and yeah. i will now list you a uh, series of series of uh, roles they had on other shows and let's see if you can match the actor to the role okay so the first role i've got for you is this person played reed jansen in ski school oh i i tell you right now it's dean paul martin dpm yeah dr billy hayes billy's to his friends <laughs> Slick Willie to his friends. Slick Slick Willie. That's a good nickname. Yeah. Next up, this actor played Leslie Van <laughs> Vanden Kellen. Leslie Vanden Kellen on Newhart. On Newhart? I watched Newhart, but I don't remember this character. And Leslie could go either way. It could be a man or and woman. And many episodes. This is not just a one off. This is many episodes of Newhart. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna go with um uh 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 Jennifer Holmes, Jane Miller. J H I don't remember it, though. I watched Newhart, but I don't remember this person in it. The next actor played Melissa in Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. Oh, that's Courtney Cox. All right. And next up. I forgot she was in that. 
I did too until I was putting out. I'm like, I can't even picture her in it. Did I tell you I rewatched Ace Ventura not too long ago? It's a it's talk about a bizarre timestamp. It's it's odd that he was such a huge star because the script is mostly Jim Carrey walking to a room and just like like making him a face, and that's the joke. Anyways, but like we loved it. That's very weird. I do remember at some point my dad rented it and brought it home, and we had that turned off in twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't for you huh he was just like this is not appropriate <laughs> yeah fair enough next up this car- this actor played the manager in the sting 2 oh you know i've never seen the sting 2 it has oh uh i wish kevin was here he would tell me who the cast was in the sting 2 because i know uh it's like they just they took all the like the great cast of the first one they're like mm, what about the c list um who would have been in that What's the character name? The manager. Okay, I'm, I guess I'm going to guess Max Wright. All right. Dick, Dick Stetmeyer, which is a good name. Good it's character. A good name. And now uh, your next one. Who played Chris in the Ally McGraw film Players? Oh, I don't know if I've seen that film with Ally McGraw, huh? I, I think I've really messed this up. But I, I'm just going to say, oh, I've messed this up. Who I have left? I've, Do you want to undo something? Well... I have Mark Thomas Miller, but there's no way it's him. He's not old enough. Oh, we'll just, we'll just say him. I can't go back now. Aren't they all the same age? <laughs> yeah. I suppose... You know what? I'm having trouble because I'm forgetting this is in the 80s. and this. Thing. So let's just go Mark Thomas Miller. Johnny, Johnny B. MTM. Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> <laughs> is that how she's referred to? I, That's I what she know. asks. She asks her servants to refer to her as that. Isn't that her production company when the cat meows? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Because it's like you're an probably MGM right. Par- it's an MGM parody. There you go. And finally, your final guess, Jordan, is p- this actor played the role of Gorville in the Tom Hanks film Mazes and Monsters. Oh, I've always wanted to watch that. Um, I have an actor left. Who do I have left? All you haven't cast yet is Kevin Peter Hall. Oh, yeah. Let's say he's in that. K P H. K K P H. Well, Jordan, let me just tally your score here. You know what? I was saying that might make sense. Maybe he like because uh, he's such a tall a gentleman. Maybe he was dressed up as one of the mazes and or monsters. <laughs> yeah, probably the maze. I would guess. <laughs> Jordan, you have four out of six. Hey, that's pretty good. So that means I only pissed up two. Yeah, yeah. You were correct about uh, Kevin Peter Hall. He was in Mazes and Monsters. Wow. You were correct about Courtney Cox, of course, in Ace yeah. Ventura. You were correct about Jennifer Holmes in Newhart. Nice. And you were correct about Max Wright in The Sting 2. Wow. So uh, who I messed up uh, Dean and uh, Mark. Was that right? That's correct. Uh, Mark Thomas Miller, Johnny B, was in Ski School. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Ski School. And Dean Paul Martin was opposite Ally McGraw in Players <laughs> as her uh, tennis player she played with. Oh, have you ever seen that? I've never. I don't even know who Ally McGraw is. <laughs> You don't know Ally McGraw? She was a big, a big uh, star in the seventies. I knew you would know, so that's why I mm. included her name. <laughs> she was married to Steve McQueen for a short time. No, oh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Good job, Jordan. Four out of six, pretty good. Hey, pretty good. And you, you know what? Uh, it's nice to see uh, these actors had careers before their horrible, horrible demises. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Poor everybody. Yeah. Well, it, it happens. Hopefully, not in a plane. <laughs> that's 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 the one you think is the worst. <laughs> Well, what do you think? No, the worst is the uh, unintentional contraction of AIDS, I say, is the worst. Oh, yeah, I think that one might be the most unpleasant. I have to say, this is a, a great, what would you rather? You got your disfiguring, you've got your dying in a plane crash, you've got your accidental AIDS transfusion, and then you've got dying on the street with drug addicts because of your life. I don't know. It's like none of these are great choices. This is the saddest lead into an episode yet. Yeah, I'll choose uh, being a billionaire because of uh, residuals from my acting payments on Friends. <laughs> oh, man. What is going on with these Mrs. of Science episodes? Didn't we only talk about the Challenger disaster last week? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right. Well, let's well, – here, here, we'll start we'll, – we'll bring this back up. We're going to pull this plane up, you know, pull on the <laughs> throttle. And uh, because episode two has what might be my favorite title of an episode of anything we've seen in 200 of these – which is Your Place or Mayan. Yes, here's the IMDb summary for episode two, <laughs> Your Place or Mayan. After a friend of Billy and Elle is killed, they go on a search for a lost Mayan treasure with the map they were given by him. 
their discovery could very well rewrite Mayan history. I disagree that it could rewrite Mayan history. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. Well, it's episode two, and it's time for their Indiana Jones episode. Yeah, they really lean into it. And uh, let me just say this as we discuss, does the whole map thing, does it work? Does it make sense? I don't know if much of this episode makes any sense, but yeah. they really want you to know what you're getting into. Because when it starts, we see Billy and Elle, who I guess live together in that beach house on like uh, Santa Monica Boulevard or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm assuming they do live together. It's possible, though, they just like hang out all the time, too, because they're like, this is, it's so like Los Angeles 80s. Uh, Because they're just, like, watching a TV in their backyard, like a small tube TV, like, hanging out in shorts, eating popcorn, like, on the boardwalk. Yeah, having a great time. Yeah. And uh, the show they're watching is a black and white kind of fake Indiana Jones that they've shot for the episode. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it it, it looks hard. Actually, the transition, I thought, was pretty well. It worked pretty well. Because what you get is them watching this old... I assume it's supposed to be, like, a serial. I would uh, assume. so they're watching an Indiana Jones esque kind of movie, and then they do a cut to show a uh, a similar situation with a person in current time who's also running away, uh, matching the sort of action that we're seeing on the black and white TV. And I thought that worked pretty well. Yeah, and this person on the run is archaeologist who specializes in Mayan studies. His name is Augie. <laughs> is that it? Was it just Augie? I don't know. I I didn't care about the rest of his name. They just kept calling him Augie. I'm like, Augie, all right. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you because uh, what we're going to get to is they're going to watch it. Augie's going to run away. We're going to find out he's actually in Los Angeles and he sort of gets out of this grate and runs down. And there's there's a guy, which I will note, chasing him in the least conspicuous vehicle ever, which is a red beetle. Um, yeah, I know, right? Was it a, it's like a VW bug or beetle. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, why would you choose that as something to be uh, hidden anyways, regardless uh he like runs and gets to billy's door and almost dies instantly well i mean he does he does the classic thing where he gets out a couple lines that are just enough to set up a mystery and then he dies but what was he dying of i couldn't or, tell you either he like climbs he out that injured. sewer gets there dies on their doorstep gives them a not before he gives them a treasure map and one other clue the name mrs getty <laughs> mrs getty and then he dies yeah I was uh, I was like, oh, no, is this going to be like spaghetti? Is that what this is going to be? That's what I thought. It was going to be like he mispronounced something and they're going to end up like eating pasta at the end of the episode. <laughs> Miss Getty, I was trying to say spaghetti. <laughs> That's what I thought. Anyway, it's not that. He dies and then they do a hard cut to his funeral. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, to make it even worse that he died just on a doorstep from causes unknown, is that the only people at his funeral is Billy elvin l whatever we call him and then what i like is like a heckler yeah there's a dude they're standing like billy and l are standing at his like <laughs> coffin giving a speech before it's being lowed down yeah 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 we never get any wider shots so the implication is they're at a big funeral but you never see anybody else but standing up there next to the coffin with both of them is a man just eating a really large sandwich <laughs> over the coffin and he just keeps going i heard he was a loony <laughs> Yeah, and he just keeps saying that. And they're like, um, can you stop? It's his funeral. And he's like, Aloni. <laughs> I got this great sandwich. <laughs> there's there's a lot of, um, uh, in the in this show, there's a lot of weird little, uh, not asides, I don't even want, like weird little characters and weird little lines pop up. There's this odd sense of humor, sensibility that's not quite coming to the surface, but sort of appears every now and then. There is, yeah, there is this like, oddball vibe that i think is the right move on their part but they haven't yeah they can't find a way to make it cohesive to the show yet yeah so you just have this like a weird character who shows up at a funeral and heckles and you're like "Uh, okay is is this important the answer is no no unfortunately it also ends up being like one of the best parts of the episode and you're just like oh why let's just have more of that i guess yeah yeah turns out that uh doc ock doc (laughs) og let's call him doc ock (laughs) <laughs> has uh, devoted his life to finding the tomb of the last Mayan king, Nacrotles, I believe they pronounce it as. Mm-hmm. And Billy and Elle decide with this treasure map, they're going to kind of take up the mantle for him and see what they can figure out. Um, unfortunately, at, since we've since the pilot, what we've come to learn, what we come to learn is there's been they, some retooling. They have not been fired from Humanidine. Apparently, Humanidine has rehired them. They are still working in human investigations team, and now they kind of have I wouldn't say a boss, but like a supervisor. Who is mostly just like there to like kind of try to like get them to do their work, and he's always put upon, and his name is Dick yeah. So Stettmeyer. what what they've done to retool it is that I think someone went, you know what, this is too much 
conflict to have them in the military kind of fighting all the time. I don't think that's what they wanted. So they're like, let's just pretend that kind of didn't happen. They're back working at the company, but we need some sort of conflict. So what we're just going to do is like a stressed out boss who's worrying about like accounting. That's what they've essentially... I, I, I think it's probably a better decision because now you have you have that one other um, uh, place to kind of play in, this this lab, which they really go for it um, in the next episode where it's like, it's almost chaotic with the amount of like insanity that's happening inside of the, the, the lab. Yeah, yeah. They can have a kind of experiments always going on there and weird things exactly. happening. Um, my favorite part about this new character is Dick Stepmeyer. This is the play by Max Wright. Um, He's their Vincenzo. Yeah, he's always just put upon. He's mostly just begging them to get this, their job done. But they do a twist on a classic joke that I kind of enjoyed, where when you meet him and throughout the episode, they Billy keeps calling him Richard. He's like, Richard, calm down. Richard, what are you doing? And the character just keeps getting mad. He's like, my name is Dick. Call me Dick. Yeah, that's right. Which, you know, it's a nice twist on what would normally be the formula where the, like, cat, the catty leading man would be like calling him Dick instead of Richard. Hey, and that's a good note. Um, now, uh, uh, old uh, Billy, he's clearly going to be like our, uh, he's the, your everyman, right? He's the character we've seen a million times. He's this straight white male lead who's like kind of handsome. He's kind of sarcastic and he like plays by his own rules. Um, how, how do you think now? We, we watch, we're now talking about episode two. Is he working? Do you like him as a lead? I actually think the actor is sort of charismatic in some ways. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think the character is working but he is likable enough that i find him okay i'd agree he they're, they're, everything actually the casting in this is not bad i think they have as we've seen in a million shows weirdly too many cast for the plots they have and they don't know what to do with all of them so you have to keep having characters kind of wait behind that's happening quite a bit um but otherwise the actual i think the performers are doing a pretty good job yeah it just feels like they haven't quite figured out how to write for the performances they're giving yet so it yeah. doesn't always quite line up and they also um have not figured out how to use the shrinking ability very well it's what i was it's what i feared was going to happen it's exactly how they're using it in these episodes <laughs> At any rate, uh, what's happening in Humanodyne is they're supposed to be doing research and, I guess, a presentation to the board of directors on memory, just like a general presentation on memory like you do in high school or something, I guess. And really has very little... I only mention it because it's going to come up a tiny bit later in a very confusing way. But while they're doing... While they're kind of talking to Stetmeyer, Glow drops by our, of course, Courtney Cox, her her psychic ability uh, sidekick. And she is dressed as a cowboy as she enters the offices. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, but like a, um, uh, uh, like I knew right away what it was. Like it's a themed restaurant uniform, but it's like cowboy esque. So it's like, you know, everything's a little bit bigger and brighter and more vibrant. Yeah, they're they're building out the world of the, since the pilot. Now she has a job at a diner, and she's I guess they're delivering their lunch. Which is, uh, did you catch what their lunch order was? No, no. What was it? I got your big barneys with fritters and cream. <laughs> that's disgusting sounding um uh what i th- i thought when i saw her uh do this and then they consistently have her later on they go to the restaurant that she works at i thought it'd be a fun gag that every episode she has a different part-time job because she can't keep a job and it's just like a different ludicrous outfit That'd if they just never gag. mentioned it i thought that's pretty funny but i doubt that's what they're gonna do well they're clearly not they've, they've committed for some reason to that she works at a diner <laughs> yeah yeah which maybe is gonna be like maybe it's gonna be like another set piece I mean, they, they've used it, uh, not this episode, but the next episode. Maybe, maybe that's the plan. Who knows? At any rate, she sees this treasure map that they got from the dying Dr. Augie. And yeah. in a very <sighs> Kolchak-style way, they've pinned yeah. it to the wall. And she walks in and she sees something pinned to the wall. And she says, hey, this is just like the art of a guy I know from Juvie named Angel Marino. Why do you have his art on your wall? Yeah. I for, I didn't catch that she knew him at first, but then I realized that's what it was because it seemed to be so out of left field of her being like, oh, hey, that's a famous graffiti artist's art. And he's famous for drawing Mayan style maps, art, maps <laughs> on walls. It's it's like it, there's there's a real uh, 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 loose threads here. 
Yeah, it's a bit. It's certainly some stretches going on. But anyway, Angel turns out hangs out with a quote barrio gang. So they get the entire gang together. They, all the misfits of science climb into that ice cream truck and drive down to the gang's turf. And you know they immediately find the gang. And like the leader has a gun. He's threatening with a gun. So Johnny B gets out and just like check out my lightning powers and like burns down a billboard. <laughs> yeah, and then they're like, "You guys are all right." <laughs> yeah, it's true. They're not even. They're not afraid, and they're not intimidated. They're just like. Pretty cool. I guess you can talk to Angel now. Yeah. And Angel comes out. And do you did you see who he was played by? No, who was that? Angel is played by the blockbuster producer and writer of Independence Day, Stargate, and Geostorm, Dean Devlin. Oh, I wouldn't have known. I looked at his IMDb and I was like, oh my god, this is this is like one of the most famous writer producers. Wow. And he started out as Angel, the a uh, uh, person who has a genetic memory with his Mayan great grandfather. Yes, uh, I believe seven years after this, he'll write Universal Soldier, and his career will kick <laughs> off on that. The side of writing and producing blockbuster. Good for him. Absolutely. Honestly, really great career for him. Yeah, yeah, that is. But yes, I. But but uh, to my point, um, uh, genetic memory is something that this episode will um, hang on. But they weirdly don't really answer it or. Or really go into it when I I think maybe you'd agree. I think it's the interesting idea here is that because what we're going to learn and again, I'm not spoiling anything because they don't lean into this at all is that the reason Angel's art looks the way it is is because he has there's a theory of this genetic memory, which is memories are transmitted through generations. So you without knowing it subconsciously um, have information that your past generations had. So he has a connection to that he doesn't even can't even understand to something in the past as as sort of a workaround for why he can read maps and why he can understand the language because he never learned it which is there's there's something there that's kind of cool but they're just like it's just a way to get them out of uh holes they've written themselves into yeah i found similarly this felt like such a throwaway literally the only talk of genetic memory is someone will just say the line it's just like he must have genetic memory and i'm just like so this is the only like it felt like they wrote an episode and they're like, oh, it's called Misfits of Science. And I guess they're supposed to be encountering unusual people every episode. And we haven't done that yet. It's like, ah, uh, genetic memory. He didn't learn it from his grandpa. It's just all in his brain. Like, it yeah. was just such a weird throwaway that felt like it's like they were desperate to tie it back to the core concept of the show, but just didn't care. I think it, it almost felt a little bit like they were like, okay, well, we have to do a, a, something on Mayan culture. Um, let's find uh, a, a Mexican. Oh, wait, that's offensive um, that he would just understand. I don't know. He's got like memory from his ancestors. Done. Not offensive anymore. Well, yeah, it just it it felt really last minute. They knew they wanted to make an Indiana Jones episode. And they're like, oh, but we have to tie it back to the theme of our show. So let's just have Dick Stetmeyer say something about a memory research project. <laughs> and then later we'll just have them say, I don't know, his genetic memory, I guess. And it's like done now it's a yeah. weird misfits of science episode i'm like yeah ah, okay you guys that's tenuous at best yeah at any rate uh they find him and they're like hey can you come back to the lab and try to help us try to read this map and of course that vw bug you mentioned earlier shows up and menaces them again but like they shoot at him and he gets away yeah to, to no effect so let us know there's something else happening in the background anyway with with angel's help they're able to interpret the treasure map and like kind of get a sense of what it is and as they're looking at her they're like where could it be ever they've looked everywhere in mexico for this tomb and dr billy for some reason has the brain wave that he realizes the map they're looking at isn't of mexico but is actually of los angeles that mm -hmm. the mayans moved out of mexico to la at some point in ancient history yeah so there's a tomb in under los angeles somewhere and so they realize there's a tomb cave that they need to get to. And conveniently, it's right where they are. Not just anywhere, Jordan. Beverly Hills. <laughs> and That's Jordan, right. you see, they really did rewrite Mayan history. They moved mm -hmm. to California. <laughs> they moved to Beverly Hills. <laughs> anyway, they head out to Beverly Hills and like start looking at some of the businesses they suspect like the tomb might be under. And like they end up like going to the basement of a fancy restaurant where you get a classic like, the the maitre d won't let these riffraff into the restaurant sort of scene but it, it also like i think they were going for that sort of like ferris bueller-esque sort of scene but it doesn't really work at all because well, never the whole thing is to, to get it. in yeah they don't commit to it so like they kind of he kind of like has this weird 
uh, conversation with the guy. He like bribes him, of course, like the money's not very good. And then, but they get to the table, but then they just like run away and he sees them run away and go like where they're not supposed to. And the maitre d's like, oh, well, my part's done. Yeah. yeah. Well, I believe he calls the police, but anyway, they go. Oh, that's to the ba- true. You're right. He does. At any rate, they go into the basement of this place and they like smash through a couple of walls in the basement using Johnny B's electricity powers. And they like just end up. There's a, like a tease where they're like, oh, it looks like they found Mayan runes. And then you, the lights turn on. They're like, oh, they just broke into the basement of a museum, I guess. Yeah. Which I, I get the gag. But like, don't you think they would have known they were right by the museum? It does. I know. It, none of it really like adds up to much. And then the police show up. Angel gets away. But the rest of the misfits are uh, arrested. And we get to see where we get to see Dick bail them out of jail. And the misfits are like, oh, I can't believe it. We, we almost we thought we had it, but we didn't. Yeah, <laughs> and what's really weird is like you know what do you say like halfway through the episode now? yeah yeah probation officer jane suddenly arrives i forgot she was on the show i know you know and she just shows up and i mean the next episode she has a li- they kind of give her a like a d plot um but this episode there's no reason for her and i think she shows up now and then a couple scenes later they're like hey uh wait with the van yeah yeah well that's just it she's there for one specific reason that we'll get to but she shows mm-hmm. up Angel returns after getting away to come back to the Misfits to help them because he returned after escaping to his gang and the gang was like, hey, we want you to go back and rejoin the Misfits so that you can steal the treasure for the gang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very weird. Um, at and any I'll rate, say, everyone's motivation in this episode is muddled at best. Yeah, yeah. And at any rate, in that interim, as he came back to them, he's also figured out who Miss Getty is. And the answer is, it's a store or a restaurant in Beverly Hills. <laughs> However, I just have to say, uh, this was a time where uh, you couldn't have just Googled that, you know? That's true. You you couldn't have known. You couldn't have looked at a yellow page. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's too much work for Billy. <laughs> anyway, they hop in the ice cream truck, drive over to this uh, this Miss Getty's, and they, of course, like find these entrance to the sewer that uh, Doc Augie came out at the beginning of the episode. And they, they all go down, and uh, Probation Officer Jane's like, well, I can't go with you. I'm an officer of the law. I'll just stay here with the ice cream truck. <laughs> And if you were wondering why she came in to the last, like, half of this episode very abruptly, it's because as soon as they leave, she is kidnapped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were just like, oh, we need a character. Oh, well, oh, right, we forgot Jane exists. Stick her in. They're just like, oh, all our other characters are super powered, so it's hard to hold them hostage. Good thing we've got Jane. <laughs> yeah. Do you think this will be her recurring thing? I mean, can you imagine you're just, like, sitting there waiting for your next script, and, like, you get this, and you're like, ugh. I'm getting written off this show so fast. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the fact that you don't come until halfway through the episode and you're there for three pages to be kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, can't feel like job security, I tell you that. No. At any rate, they go underground, and the underground here is just all Mayan runes and tunnels, and Angel's able to read the hieroglyphics and, like, figure out that if because you Because of his genetic memory. Genetic memory. And he figures out if you push certain things, you, like, open secret passageway doors. And By like, the way, I love... I love this because it's a fun thing in, in TV and movies that like, you know, there's ancient ruins and these ancient civilizations have taken the time to create like trap doors and stuff of like that all it's all these mechanical things. I'm like, I, I, I think it's a lot of effort for a tomb. If they don't want someone in, just don't make a door that spins on an axis. You know what I mean? Also, if, the, you, hit, yeah. if you hit the right code. Also, that hundreds of years later, all these mechanisms built in stone. Work yeah. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> but they do. Rate. They're fun. At any rate, they open one of these doors, and behind it, there's revealed the bad guys of the episode waiting with Jane as a, their hostage. And this is the most... I, I mean, I'll tell you as what, best what I can figure want? out what this guy was about, but he seems to be some sort of rich guy who may have been into real estate development. Yes. I, yes. Because, I, of unclear. course, I'm telling you, the amount of villains we've seen on this podcast that are into real estate development, it's unbelievable. It's a, I mean, they're all villains, every real estate developer. <laughs> Um, and he found the runes under a building he bought, and he's been trying, I guess, for some time to find the king's tomb to get the treasure, but only because he's interested in one particular jade yep. leopard sculpture. Because that's right, yeah, not entirely clear. But at some point, they look at a book and there's like, here's a here's a jade snake sculpture. That's cool. And here's a jade leopard sculpture. And apparently, he has the rest of the sculptures he's just after this last one but he doesn't care about any of the other treasure and it's weird the extent he's going to like they're trying to murder people and things for this sculpture and you're like why I, we don't know because he's had literally one scene 
Yeah, and he's got so many people working for him down there. Like, it's shocking that the Misfits took so long to find it because it's just like an entire construction crew is down there. That's right. It's, it is funny, and it sort of undercuts the idea that they've seen something special and even that these booby traps would still be going because, yeah, it's like there's an entire team of people excavating the site. At any rate, the bad guy offers Angel the opportunity to betray the Misfits and help him and he'll give uh he'll give angel the rest of the treasure it's all his he doesn't want it like he can just take the rest of the treasure and angel mm-hmm. like is like you got a boss and they uh essentially close one of these trap doors trapping the misfits of science in an airtight room where they're going to die right yeah it's that is that thing you've seen a million times you know it's like uh and it's like it did one did angel betray them you know he has to have his uh uh yeah. he has to turn his allegiances and then the second thing is they're caught in a uh, like this little tomb and they there's no way out however they have special powers well that's what i was just like i'm like good luck catching the misfits of science except uh it, there's too dry it's too dry for johnny b's electricity to no, work it's too damp it's, too, it's damp. too damp it's too damp so his electricity won't work uh l's just like i'll shrink down and crawl through that hole and he does and puts on a michael jackson outfit for some reason yeah he says this is a weird gag. This is again. This is one of the the bits of sense of humor. I say. I, I said previously. I don't think quite are working. This is another example. For you're just like. Wouldn't it be funny if he was wearing an, an entire Michael Jackson outfit? Because he's like wearing the hat and the glove and everything. Like it's like. Okay, I, I understand if you had to put the shirt and pants on. And the, the, what he says is the only thing in his size was a Michael Jackson toy in a store. So apparently he bought that Michael Jackson toy stripped it naked and then kept the clothing for himself yeah, for yeah. it. He lost Just his this old jogging sort of scenario. suit apparently. <laughs> yeah. At any rate, he goes through this little hole in the wall. He's like, I'll crawl through that and let us out. And he goes in and he's like, oh, I'm stuck. I can't get out now. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, well, surely Glow and her incredible psychic powers to push things around will help. She never tries to do anything. No. No. So they, they're literally you, have are, to just, you have to ignore her powers for a bit. They literally give up on literally every power these people have for this episode. They just don't want them to have powers this episode. Yeah, it's because, again, because uh, uh, Glow, uh, Courtney Cox's character, she's a little overpowered. So they have to kind of like just forget about it because they need Angel to then, of course, realize, have, you know, a change of heart and go, oh, I will let them out. Yeah. And I mean, as part of the like kind of muddled, somewhat uh, unfortunate running of this episode. Angel's, of course, brought by the bad guys through the tomb and they're looking for the thing and he walks by and he sees all these construction workers like they're like taking the tomb apart in pieces and I guess their plans to sell it to museums or something. They're like taking it all apart. Again, they, uh, what, I, what I should really stress though is that you're kind of going over this quickly, but it doesn't make any sense. Like they don't give any time to build any of these motivations. So you're just like, why do I, like, is he really that bad, this bad guy? I don't know. Should they be trying to stop him? I don't know. It, are, are, is their search any more valid than his? I don't know. It's just like, wouldn't it be fun if it was kind of like an Indiana Jones episode, but we don't give any thought as to why anyone's doing anything? Well, I mean, the only reason they see them, like, taking apart, like, the Mayan, like, runes to, like, cut them up, and I, I for whatever reason, is, is so that Jane, who for some reason, they've kept their hostage Jane, even <laughs> though they should have pushed her into that room with the misfits. I don't know why they've kept her. They've only kept her so she can point out how they're ruining the artwork of the Mayans. And he, she can say that to Angel and be like, can you That's see what right. they're doing to your ancestors? And Angel can like have that like, oh, no. And she's like, you're an artist. Would you want that to happen to your art? Yeah, yeah. The only way she can get him to be uh, uh, to sympathize is or empathize is to be like, imagine this was happening to your stuff. He's like, That's right. I also have feelings. <laughs> anyway, they very quickly find the right door to get inside the tomb. They push the button. They go inside. And it's full of treasure. And like there's a big sculpted head on the wall i guess it's supposed to be of the last mayan king and um what's really weird is like at the end of the episode (laughs) i know what you're gonna say jane turns to dr billy and says did you notice how much that sculpture on the wall looked like angel it was supposed to look like angel i know i thought the exact same thing they're just like look at that sculpture i'm like it just looked like any generic face in the wall and here's the thing they probably like the set deck department or props, whoever's doing it, they probably built this thing before they cast the thing, so they just did a face. But it is that funny leap where you're like, this doesn't look anything like him. No one would ever look at this and say it looked like him. Yeah, like, I'm like, was I supposed to see that and immediately be like, oh my god, he's the reincarnation of the king. It's just like, I like, they had to have someone say it at the end of the episode, and even the, and when they say it, you're like, 
did it? <laughs> but again, it's to and that's to tie it back to this genetic memory thing that they've spent no time as like building at all. Yeah, it's totally bizarre. At any rate, they find the tomb. Jane is like decides she'll do a distraction. She runs at the bad guy so that Angel can like run away uh, since he's having second thoughts about this whole thing and go like save the misfits. And he goes back. He rescues them all from like the hole they're stuck in and then get the, gets them out. And they all run back to the tomb and they very easily, you know, over, you know, they use their superpowers. They beat up the bad guys. Angel sees the lead bad guy has Jane. He's like he's climbing that giant face on the wall. And so um, dumb. The genetic memory in Angel, he's just like, oh, no, bad guy. I, I believe that's booby trap. Don't touch it. And the bad guy's like, mm, I think I'll touch it. And, the, you know, the, the entire tomb, the entire tomb, the entire rune start collapsing around them. It gives you forgot Dr. to say that that Billy swings on a rope to save Jane. Exactly. It gives him a chance to be Indiana Jones. So he gets to swing on a rope and grab Jane and swing back. And then they, like, all run out of the tomb, leaving all the bad guys to die. And we cut to stock footage of a building being imploded. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I think they also killed all the construction workers who were just doing their job. They were just hired to do that job. Dead. They're all bad. <laughs> hey, do you remember the last uh, TV show we watched where we had to have the star swinging on a rope to save the day? I don't remember. Which was that? Auto Man. Auto Man. Which, when did he swing on a rope? Um, uh, what was the main character? Uh, uh, Desi Arnaz Jr.? Oh, yeah he, yeah. Uh, he had to like swing on it. Well, it was an episode he did. Then you were you were on the edge of your seat. I was, yeah. This I'll, I'll give this to uh, um, Misfits of Science. This was better. This was this was a bit better. I mean, it was definitely they like knew what they were playing with. They're like, here's a, yes. here's our chance to do an homage to Indiana Jones. Yeah. At any rate, it all ends up with Angel. He's gotten a job painting a mural, so everything's worked out for him because he's quote the last mine artist. Yeah, he they they sort of get it in like everything worked out. He's getting paid for it because people like his graffiti. I'm like, okay, sure. Great, great. It was such a weird episode that hinged absolutely zero percent on any of the things the misfits do right exactly but uh one little thing that's uh not very important to the episode what i like is that um at the end angels like they're watching him paint this um this art on the wall and uh but for some reason like they're helping him like he's like hey guys come over here like courtney cox is like also spray painting and stuff i'm like why She's not the artist. Why is she helping at all? It's just because they need the characters to do something other than just sit and stare. Yeah, yeah. The whole gang has to be there. So I guess they're 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 assisting him. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. Anyway. All right. Here's the IMDb summary for episode three. Guess what's coming to dinner? I finally figured out a way to slingshot radio signals out into deep space or off a satellite. And finally, two nights ago, I uh, I contacted extraterrestrials. Did he's Martians? Aliens. Harry, genius bottle washer at Humanodyne, cobbles together a transmitter from company discards and makes contact with aliens. At least that's what he thinks he's done. The reality is far more dangerous. Hmm. And did, did you recognize uh, James Sloyan, who plays uh, Harry? I did not. He's and he's been in a ton of stuff for for a long long time. I think he he might be passed away at this point. Um, but he's he's been in lots of Star Trek, both Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. If you go back and you see, he's played like multiple characters. He's one of those actors who they're like they must have been like he was great. Let's bring him back and put a different forehead on him. I I recognized him and I can't remember the episode, but I know that I know he played a, a Romulan in an episode because I was like that's that face. It's a Romulan face, <laughs> but I can't remember what the episode was. I feel that's a good gig. If you like, don't mind getting that makeup put on, you I just get to so come too. back. I think it would have been super fun. Like, if you were going to, like, I would never want to be an actor. But if I had to be an actor, I'd be like, can I be the actor? You just keep putting different prosthetics on my face every day. That's fun. I really like there's, uh, like, this, uh, new genera- uh, this new generation who's finding Star Trek now with all the new ones. There's, like, a real obsession with Jeffrey Combs and the number of aliens The roles he played in Tuesdays 9. There's, like, huge, just, like, fan bases of people just, like, obsessed with Jeffrey Combs on Star Trek. <laughs> Right. That's funny. All right. Well, let's talk about this episode. It starts with this genius, eccentric inventor, Harry, and his family. And Harry, I guess, has been trying to be a successful inventor his whole life. The only real inventions we see are two of his. One is a barbecue, which that has... Spins. Yeah, it has like a spinning grill on top so that the burgers, because of the centrifugal momentum, just get flung into the dirt when you use it. Yeah, I think... Ugh. I think I think the idea of this is supposed to be like easier access to the hamburgers, 
but I don't know why he just doesn't make it go slower. But I think really um, the point of his role or what this is similar to is the dad in Gremlins. It's the exact same role. It's like he's a kind of down in his luck inventor and all the inventions are um, so far out there in terms of like their usability that there it's kind of a joke that's yeah, he's, it's yeah. the exact same role i mean the only other invention we see of his well we see another one but the only other non-useful invention we see of his in this episode is the robot that serves coffee named eugene mccarthy <laughs> <laughs> oh that made me laugh but uh but it seems to work okay that one seems to work okay at any rate he's so he's sort of you see he's kind of this like absent-minded professor kind of inventor who yeah. does stuff and he's got a teenage son who really thinks that his dad is a loser. <laughs> yeah, this was a weird like plot line because through the whole episode, he needs to... There's a couple things. He needs to be convinced that his dad's not a loser, which, by the way, doesn't really happen, but he still is, is going to have that turn by the end. And it's But it's mostly because they realize they need one of the characters to sort of like get him on that path. So they choose Johnny B because Johnny B has nothing to do and you don't want him too involved because again, he's overpowered. So he's going to spend most of the time leaning against a tree, giving like sage wisdom about fathers. Yeah. To this, to this Josh kid who thinks his dad's yeah. a bit, a bit of a whack job. And like, it's truly by the end of it, he like will swing back and forth where he's like, Oh, yeah. my dad's cool. My dad's not cool. My friends like him. He doesn't like him. And like, he just kind of like at the end, he just ends up being like, Oh, I changed my mind. I like my dad, I guess. Like it's not, none of it's very motivated. Right. Exactly. Um, and of course he's got a wife and daughter who are always defending him, but they, I don't even think they get names. Like it's just, it's, <laughs> no. they're just it's, kind of it there. Was, yeah. It was weird that they even had them as characters. Like it was just like, well, we need the nuclear family. So they're there. Like, yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't do anything. <laughs> anyway, Harry, what he's done, he's built a communication device in his garage using a satellite and like things he steals from work, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we should say he works at the, what is their company called again? Humanidine. Humanidine. He works there, but he's sort of like this very intelligent man, but he's kind of also that like bumbling, nutty professor type thing. So they don't really seem to want him around, but he has been apparently taking stuff from the yes. lab and like building his own experiments. With they them. say he's a test tube washer there. That's his job at Humanidine. Yeah. I didn't know if that was like an insult or it was literally his job. I think they mean it's literally his job. <laughs> but yeah, well, he's built this communication device. He's been firing her into space trying to make contact with aliens. And on this particular day, uh, he manages to pick up a signal, and um, it's it's from a, it seems to be from an alien planet. And um, basically, as his family says, he's been looking for Wookies for a long time, and he fi- this is the day he finally gets a reply. So now let me ask you this: so he's conceivably sending signals out into space that are sort of coded into like binary code. Yes. Right. Does this does this work? This is a part of the weird this is just this is part of the plot of the show is like we'll yeah. find out one thing he took was a, a, a transicon it's called it's something that L and Lincoln or uh, Billy and Lincoln have invented uh, L whatever his name is <laughs> and the idea of it is it's sort of a universal translator is what it is it like takes whatever language you put into it breaks right. it down to binary and then sends it off with the theory being whatever receives it should be able to like undo this very basic code to understand what the language is and he's mm-hmm. he's stolen it from a dumpster at work and built this thing so like we're supposed to just sort of wave over and be like oh he just has a universal translator they built i guess is the idea right yeah which which to be fair it's like sure that's enough that's enough explanation i'm fine with that that wasn't the problem i had an issue with it was how this works into the plot that i was like i don't know if this makes sense i mean it doesn't really make a ton of sense because what we see is we go to humanidine and like dr billy's having an argument with dick about um the fact that one of their inventions they've just made spoiler it's the transicon uh <laughs> it's being used by the military right now to do run experiments but the military won't ex- won't share their results and billy's just like i really want to see these results and you know we're supposed to like li- be left with this tease that'll come up later in the episode uh-huh. and harry drops by the labs which are you know pretty wacky in this episode and he's he's basically there he's like he wants he wants to invite everyone to dinner so he can tell them about something cool that's happened and we immediately see that at work harry is a social pariah no one wants to spend time with yeah, and it's weird because you get that he's a little bit kooky but to be fair they're all supposed to be a little bit kooky they are in fact the misfits of science yes exactly so it's weird that they have decided that they're the they're the cool kids even in this little microcosm of their little society in this office 
they have decided who's cool and who's not, and Harry's not cool. So they turn him down for a barbecue, and it's just so they can have a scene where they like they like, uh, sorry, we're busy, man. And like you, re- I actually felt bad for him. It was one of those things where he's just like, oh, okay, because it's clear they just don't want to hang out with him. They yeah, go to yeah. the they go to the hamburger joint. Courtney Cox, as a way because she's irritated at them, messes up their hamburger orders purposely, and then comes down and essentially reads them the riot act of being like guys why are you mean to him he's literally just asking for barbecue is it that much to be nice to him and they're like i guess we could and cut to harry's backyard barbecue complete with dirt covered burgers from his barbecue (laughs) yeah that's right yeah he's still using that (laughs) anyway harry has them all there so he announces that he has contacted alien life and sort of brings them back to his garage and after some back and forth he they kind of are like oh you're losing you're using our transicon to do this and uh how, how's, it, how's it working and they get he gets to send a signal into space and like they get a message back and they're like oh what what should we do there and he's like let's invite them to dinner yeah that's right and they end up back at humanodyne where they're trying to pick the best place to ask the aliens to land it'll be like you know a big enough field from the land and they pick out a marsh i guess that's near near harry's home and while they're gone the government has tracked the signal he's been beaming to his garage and have kind of um They've, they've quarantined it off, basically. They've quartered mm-hmm. it all off. It's very... I mean, characters will literally say this in the episode. It looks very E.T.-esque. I think... It, it, it really does. It's like someone was just like, remember that happened in E.T.? Let's just do that. Well, two characters ride up and they're like, it looks like Steven Spielberg's directing this part. Like, they're literally <laughs> like... They've referenced Wookiees already. So, like, a yeah. very contemporary reference. Then they reference E.T. and Spielberg. And then even in the same line, these two ki- these kids are like, maybe the Klingons are coming. Like, so, it's just like, it's all very contemporary... 80s mm-hmm. references there everyone's just dropping nonstop. yeah um and i wasn't quite sure so like what we get is we we understand now at this point the military is aware of what's happening they're clearly connected in some way you're supposed to sort of think like maybe they don't want the aliens contact or they want to be the ones to do it or maybe they just don't i don't know the, the military doesn't really want this to happen through harry but i don't know if we ever understand like any of the repercussions of this like did they arrest his wife and daughter? It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't, it. It doesn't like seem it. like it doesn't seem like they really um, uh, uh, confiscated any of his tools or anything. So I'm not really sure what the point of this uh, is, other than it's a set piece for them to break into. Yeah, that's most of it. The idea is like, yeah, the government has decided to confiscate his stuff, but they get there before they can get rid of any of it. I guess because they were taking too much time to put up those barriers. Yeah, it is really just an excuse to have them launch a very confusing plan i don't understand what the plan was still yeah i know that's what i mean i don't know yeah i don't know what their plan is at any rate the misfits are like we're gonna like do a distraction out front where billy talks to the government and then we drive an ice cream truck but in the backyard Elle's gonna shrink down and try to make the robot do something like none of it seemed cohesive and in the end all they do is kind of brute force their way in and take his equipment back with their like well, you know lightning again, and psychic powers this seemed like a scene designed to go hey we've got four characters or three of them have superpowers and billy's superpower is i guess he's like he's charming or something so you would think they would set up scenarios where again they can x-men this theme and they each sort of use their power in a way combined to get them out of scenarios and you're like isn't it amazing they have these powers a la like batman's utility belt anything they need is available but they don't know what to do so they're just like uh they'll just drive an ice cream truck through it and kind of get yeah it, there seems to be no co- i mean this, i think part of the joke is that there's no coordination but like i couldn't tell you what the plan was from the start like it just doesn't seem like there is a plan and this is also kind of a mess because i'll be honest i started writing notes of everything that happened like this guy does this and this guy does it, it doesn't matter yeah no it doesn't really make any work. sense together yeah like it doesn't make any sense together uh all that really happens is most of the misfits escape with uh, Harry's equipment, except L is still in the backyard because he got he shrunk down to cause a distraction. So Doctor Billy goes back to rescue him, and uh, this is I'm sure this was your favorite part of the episode. Yeah, Doctor Billy goes in the backyard, and L is being menaced by a dog who lifts his leg as if he's going to pee on the tiny L. <laughs> <laughs> yep, pretty good, uh, and. Billy and Elle are then both caught by the government agents because Elle, like, returns to normal size and, and basically, uh, you know, tied up and put into the back of a, a van because they've been caught by the government. Oh, I should mention, uh, I thought maybe this was going to be a running thing with um, 
uh, with L because as we've mentioned, I think in the previous uh, podcast, the when he when he shrinks and grows, he you know he's naked because the clothes don't shrink. So when he co- becomes back to a human, it's always kind of a gag of like ah I'm naked. But um, they and I think it was in the last episode where people literally get distracted because they look at his naked body and that's a way for them to get out and i thought that was going to be now a thing every time where every time he's naked it like distracts people and they're like what <laughs> more so than the actual shrinking and growing it seems to be a naked man is just is, is a great tool but they only did it in the mine episode yeah he is caught naked here but they don't they don't let, they don't escape with that they're just like well right. get in the van <laughs> harry Johnny B, Glow, Probation Officer Jane, and the rest of Harry's family, they're all together. They head out to the marsh where they've decided to, like, tell the aliens to land. They set up their equipment, and they essentially, like, send send the message to the aliens, like, please land at these coordinates, and we'll wait for you here. And as they're doing this, and I, again, very confusing what's happening here, but somehow everyone in the immediate vicinity, all the neighbors know that they are inviting aliens to the marsh so all these people just start showing up to watch the aliens land but i have no idea how that information got out there well i think they're playing i think they really want to just have the idea that there are the people that believe their aliens are kooks and they're all kind of weird misfits if you will um and so they want those people there to sort of uh, escalate and elevate the idea that what Harry is doing is so silly and crazy that only like these bumpkins would be into it. But yes, the, the what your the idea is like, why are they there? How do they know about this? This because they've mentioned this is very secretive uh, what they're doing, and the only people who would have known is the misfit. So why are all these people there? It's like just because. I think it's just to um, accentuate the idea that this is a. That only dumb people would think there's aliens. That's oh, that's interesting. I, I thought it was the opposite. I thought it was like the real people, the non-military, were rallying around them and like raising them up because they were doing you know, something maybe. great. Yeah, well, well, here's what we've learned. It's unclear if we both have two different views of the scene. Well, and it is why it's unclear. I mean, the best part of it is only that they do another one of these wild throwaway sequences where he's <laughs> setting up and like these dirt bikers like do a huge jump and like speed in big over. like in big like yellow kind of like. I don't know what you call them. They're like big yellow padded outfits. Yeah, like what you'd see a dirt biker wearing and with helmets on and like yeah. they're just drive up and they they skid to a stop in front of the in front of Harry as he gets set up and they take off their helmets and they are two very elderly people saying, "Are you the one trying to contact the aliens?" I'm like, "What is happening?" Yeah, and it's and it's for nothing. It's just like wouldn't it be funny if two really really old people were doing extreme sport biking? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like the sandwich eating guy. Like, it's actually kind of it. It's a it's one of the more fun parts of the episode because it's surprising, but it just tonally it just doesn't exactly mesh with it. Well, what's weirder is that they take the time for it in in a, a show where like they're rushing to get to things. Yeah, and then you're like, they've taken this time. Like, hold on, everyone, you're gonna love this. Yeah, you're gonna love these motorbikes, people. And I did, but <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, Billy and Al are being transported in the back of that government van. Uh, they, you know, once an hour has passed, Al is able to like shrink again. So he shrinks and gets them out of their restraints. And when they escape the van, they realize they're in the middle of like a cornfield. And they're like, oh, they must have been taking us to an underground bunker. Let's find the entrance. And they like find an entrance to the bunker. And there's like a whole sequence of them running around the bunker being chased by guards, all of it amounting to very little. Yeah. But eventually what they find is this this bunker is actually a secret project. The one that was mentioned at the start that the military was working on. And what it is, is they're going to launch a rocket. Essentially, they have a, a missile silo down here. And they're going to launch a top-secret satellite delivery system for nuclear warheads from here that is going to spin around the planet. And it is using the Transicon Universal Translator as part of its, like, I guess, core communication skills. Yeah. And what they come to realize is that Harry has not been talking to aliens. He's been talking to the other Transicon implanted in this nuclear rocket. And he's been giving the nuclear rocket coordinates to come down and explode. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that that's the whole thing is what he thought was he was transmitting like come here to visit and and meet humans. What he's saying is to the rocket is here's where you should change your trajectory to shoot us. Yes, and of course, no, but I got a question for you though. This is a nuclear warhead, right? Yes, many. They say it's multiple nuclear warheads. Okay, I know, I know, I know, I know. At any rate, they they discover this and they're able to tell the military. But for whatever reason, the rocket is also able to override all the safeties and launch itself. So, like, it's it's happening. Like, it's what, up. What it's I going. like 
is <laughs> they basically, you know, it's at that command lab you've seen a, a bunch of times. It's exactly what you think. You know, it's the board with all the buttons and the lights and stuff. And they're sort of essentially telling the military guy and both Billy and L are sort of like, this is important. You've got to do these things. And the military guy, I don't know if it's just the acting choice. He couldn't be uh, more casual about it. He's just like, well, looks like this is a problem. <laughs> and, anyway, and it was just like, that's it? That's your response? And maybe that's just his military uh, training, but he's not in a rush. I did like that guy. He was he's dragged around for the episode, and every time he comes, times he's like, they're trying to fix problems. He's like, that's not going to work. You just got yeah. you got to tell him to move dinner. Not you can't yeah. tell him to cancel dinner. The world won't take it. Just tell him to move dinner. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, Billy and Al rush to the marsh in a helicopter since they know where Harry is, and the rocket appears in the sky on its way toward them. And, like, for some reason, Harry's equipment now is no longer powerful enough, I guess, to send a message to this rocket that's coming at them. So they have to come up with an alternate plan where Johnny B climbs into a nearby Earth mover and electrifies it, and somehow that turns it into a transmission dish because it's electrified sure. so they can reach it the rocket. It is weird because you would think he would have had to um if 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 somehow electricity would magnify a signal sure um but you think he would just grab the actual board or something like that but it's like no i'll grab a piece of machinery 50 yards off yeah like, it's like i was oh, completely okay. i'm like do they need to run a cable to it or something <laughs> uh, maybe maybe we didn't see that scene they cut it yeah that's right it's At, they, they cut that it was really boring to watch them just lay cord <laughs> Anyway, this sort of works. Harry's able to get the rocket new coordinates to crash into, and it like turns and like flies into the mountain where the Earth mover is instead, and explodes. And I'm like, "It's a nuke! You're all dead." That's what's funny about this. Well, there's multiple things, but they they can change the code, so they have a nuclear warhead coming towards them. They can change it to go anywhere, and they don't say the ocean or the desert or in a different direction back up into the sky to like you know burn well, off or whatever they just they go what about maybe 50 yards from us yeah and it explodes and it's, they're just like oh it's not a nuke anymore i'm like they don't even say that they just don't they don't yeah. never address it they're just like yeah. it explodes and blows up the mountain they're like well that's done i'm like you you said it was a delivery system for nuclear warheads from space <laughs> Yeah, it would have been what would have been better is it lands and they cut to like you know stock footage of just a huge mushroom cloud and like just just you know the shots of like trees burning out and like just all this destruction and everything's exploding and then they just cut cut to them back in the lab they're like oh that was something <laughs> now we all have superpowers yeah <laughs> exactly anyway they've diverted the disaster I guess even though they still like blew up a mountain. Can you imagine if that that nuclear bomb landed and then Johnny was disfigured? Oh, <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> we'll cut that out. Don't do no, that don't cut it MTL. out. Don't cut it out. I stand by what I say. Oh, dear. Uh, at any rate, the episode ends with Harry getting a promotion to be a full researcher at Humanodyne. And then, yeah. Can you explain this to me? They say he's going to be a field researcher at Humanodyne. And then Billy and L argue about how now they have to do stuff with nuclear or with not nuclear, with toxic waste. They're like, they're like now. And I'm just like, what's like, are they trying to say they had to exchange working with toxic waste to get him? Like, I just couldn't understand what this argument. Yeah, was about. I don't know. Then they kept I, going I on sure and on either. about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. It, there's this episode. had A lot of weird. I don't know if it was like leftover things of earlier drafts. But I was like, what, what is happening? But I, I just sort of like, I'll, I guess I'll just gloss over this. doesn't really matter. Yeah, it, di it didn't make any sense to me. And then it, it ends with a final tease where Harry and his son Josh, who are now reunited as best friends, are still in his garage, still trying to send messages into space. And then they get a response to one of the messages. And it is actually from aliens this time, saying that they're going to come to Earth in 726 Earth years. And Harry says... Let's keep this one to ourselves. Yeah, I was like, which I don't. What? Why? I know it was it was odd. I think because they needed to put this button on the episode. I think because even through the series of events uh, and the changes in our characters, I think w there wasn't enough to um, uh, redeem Harry as a character. So I think they were like, oh, he also did discover aliens right so right right thus thus he thus he's he's not such a, a such a silly character he wasn't I think that's he what wasn't just a fool who crashed a nuke into the into the into la it, exactly exactly although i have to say i got it. he's like we'll be there in 726 earth years he's like let's not tell anyone i'm just like so you just 
arranged an invasion of Earth in 700 years, and you're not gonna you're not gonna like, give anyone a chance to prepare. <laughs> well, I guess he'll be long gone, so what no one's gonna care? get angry at him. Yeah, what does he care? That's um, like you, that's like you when you throw uh when when you have a picnic and you just throw your garbage all over the ground. Not my problem. <laughs> not my problem. Let's talk really quickly about those kind of D plot of this episode, which oh, was I forgot insane. Okay, Luke, when this started, uh, and they first mentioned it, yeah, and, let's, say, uh, let's say this: it's, okay. it's it's what it is. Is it starts with probation officer Jane talking to Courtney Cox's glow at some point, and Courtney Cox is like, "When are you going to tell Billy?" And she's like, "I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready to tell him." And then, as you mentioned earlier. Billy just keeps mentioning she looks like she's put on weight the entire episode. And so I'm just like, oh, they're pretending like she's pregnant, but they're going to yes. do a twist where it's actually something else is wrong with her. I thought the exact same thing because I thought there's no way the plot line of this episode is that Billy has got her pregnant and she doesn't know what to do with herself. And then at the end of the episode, the big reveal is she's like, Al has to tell Billy. He's like, haven't you noticed that Jane is pregnant? And I was like, yeah. what? And then they go into a long explanation about how it's her ex-husband's baby? Yeah, no, no. here's the thing. I think it's supposed to be vague as to if it's her ex-husband's baby or if it's Billy's baby because she's not quite sure. And because there's this whole thing of like, she's like, maybe I'll just go back to my ex-husband. He wasn't that bad because then I'll have this family stability sort of thing but i think they're playing with the idea i think they're just creating a, a possible back door of maybe it's not billy's baby i thought they were actually just saying it's not billy's baby we don't want to uh, do maybe that. i maybe. don't know and i have to assume i just have to assume it's because i mean and god god bless this actress is she's pregnant and she just you know she didn't want to lose the role so she didn't say anything and now they're having to like write it into the episode yeah may i never thought of that you you could be right but I, I here's the thing is I actually would have preferred if the like if it was like if the reveal was just like Billy got her pregnant and now this is going to be like it's not like it's not where I think the show should go. But I was just like I, I was at least like at least it's something unexpected like this changes the dynamics of the show if Billy is now expecting a child with a girl he's just dating kind of thing like you know it's at least interesting. Mm-hmm. I was just like I don't know what this plot looks like. Yeah, I don't think they're going to do that. I think they just said it so that she can just be pregnant going forward, and they just will never address it, really. But anyway, it's 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 interesting to see if this is going to be something they're going to stick with, or if they'll just retcon it real quick. I mean, they ha- I mean, they wrote it in, and they must have to stick with. It. I- I'm guessing it's because the actress is pregnant. I so I you're think probably we're have right. to see that happen. But I was, it was so funny. Like after the previous episode where she's in it for two seconds to get uh, kidnapped, and then this episode they're like, her whole plot line is like, is she going to tell Billy she's pregnant? And then the answer is eventually yes. And I'm just like, what are they going to do with this character? They barely know what to do with her as it is. And now her character is pregnant. Maybe they'll do an episode where like they've had the baby and she needs a babysitter. And so they have the people with superpowers have to take care of the baby and some adventure happens. And maybe that will be a thing, you know? What if the actress isn't pregnant, but they decided in the third episode is like, she's going to have a misfit baby. Yeah, exactly. A misfit baby. Um, and this, so, this show like, takes a real different turn going forward. We have like, uh, it's, it's kind of like adding the super scouts. We now have like a yeah. super powered baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That seems more like, um, if this was a movie and then the sequel, they're like, well, what are we going to do? Add a baby with powers. <laughs> but that, that's sort of the end of the episode. Now, before we get to ratings, Jordan, how, what did you think? This is the first time we've seen the opening credits to this series. What did you think oh, of the opening yeah. credits? Oh yeah. The opening credits are really interesting. So what they are is, you have uh, an unseen person. You just see their feet sort of like sitting by the TV. They may be on the TV. Presumably Billy's sitting out on his lawn watching the TV. Yeah. So it's, uh, but it's in a room, like in a messy room. Right. And uh, the TV is, uh, what is on the TV is a gentleman playing the piano, singing about the misfits. Yeah. And sort like of this like. Old timey um, 40s singer. Yeah. Yeah. He's like sort of like a crooner. And he's sort of singing. He's like, oh, it's the misfits. You won't believe these adventures sort of thing. And then. Billy or whoever this person is keeps hitting the TV because they don't like I guess what they're seeing they hit it so many times that eventually it crashes and then it's like hard cut to extreme 80s opening I thought it was so weird and funny I really enjoyed it yeah it is bizarre it's a bizarre opening I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it but yeah like the weird old-timey crooning of Misfits of Science to the smash of the TV, to just like a hard cut to like just driving 80s rock. and like, It suddenly becomes like Magnum P.I.'s opening, like yeah. right after it. 
and all the characters are like getting their their shots and like they're showing all the action i'm just like this is a wild opener yeah anyways it's it's pretty fun but um oh and they also i don't know if you noticed luke they slightly changed their logo as well oh did they yeah Oh, you had mentioned this off air, Jordan, but you said they also changed the Misfits of Science out uh, uniforms. They're not basketball yeah, uniforms. That's right. <laughs> I like that we were talking about this before we were recording. Um, that before they were wearing basketball like sweat kind of like uh, uh, sweat outfits. Now they're wearing. I realize uh, by the second episode they're wearing Letterman jackets. Hmm. That say Misfits yeah. of Science on the back. That still say Misfits of Science on the back. Yeah. Interesting. It's a few retools between the pilot and. <laughs> Yeah, I would, isn't that an odd thing, though? Someone made the note, they're like, enough of these hoodies, put them in Letterman's. <laughs> All right, well, you don't have any further notes, right? No, I think we can rate these. All right, Jordan. What would you like to rate the first episode, Your Place or Mayan? Well, again, look, it gets one point just for the title. That's a great pun. Great. Um, uh, I'm, I think it was, oh, look, this was a bit of a mess, but it's still kind of fun. Like, the show still has this je ne sais quoi of like there's some charm to it i kind of like the characters i like the idea i don't know if they've leaned into all the things i like the most like i don't think they've gotten as weird as they can and i don't think the adventures have gotten as crazy as they can but i still think this works but it was not a great episode by any stretch but i think it was okay i'm gonna give it a six out of ten six out of ten it's a mess though like come on it's a mess yeah, I mean, it's a huge mess for sure. I mean, you're like right. the bad guy, there's no even reason for the villain. You could cut him out entirely. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, you know, I think you're right. There's like, there's a weird sensibility like underlying it that occasionally mm-hmm. bubbles to the surface that is fun. And like, I think overall, I actually do like the cast. I think they're pretty watchable. I'd agree. But I, the, show, the episode was a mess. Had nothing to do with the misfits of science, really. It could have been anything. You are you are right. It it, it, you're, it they they were they just happened to be characters that walked into this episode. Uh, yeah, and I, so I just I I felt it was it it's goodwill kept it going because it's still fresh to me. But it, even yeah. still, I think it's a four for me. Right. You know what? I, I I you're probably closer to reality than I am. But I think that was a good point. It's the goodwill. I think the pilot was pretty strong. And I still am like, yeah, I'm still on board. So, like, if we watch this on episode 13, it's going to be a real low score. But for now, it's like, sure, it's only the second episode I've seen. Fair enough. And uh, what about Guess What's Coming to Dinner? Um, I kind of felt the same. I was thinking about it this morning. I'm like, which one did I like more than the other? They're they're both sort of similar. In some ways, I think this structurally is a better episode. But in also, on the same turn, it's somehow dumber. I'm just going to also give it a six. Yeah, I think we didn't discuss it, but like the first episode of the mind one where the genetic memory was a good idea that they never did anything with. Mm-hmm. There's a really fun idea in a, someone sending a message into space, but accidentally talking to like a sentient AI or something that's actually on Earth yeah. and causing problems. Like that's a, I mean, interesting this is, plot. What, what was the, the Matthew Broderick movie, War Games? Yeah, exactly. This is like, yeah, it's a similar sort of idea, but not executed well. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're actively knocking off War Games in it, but it's just, yeah. yeah not nearly executed as well like it's all pretty haphazardly like plotted it's it, yeah it's got a lot of the same problems where like there are fun especially when the moments are weird like the elderly dirt bikers like i was like i don't know what this is but it is fun i don't know but still i'm gonna go i liked it slightly better than the last one so i'm gonna go 4.5 mm. yeah it's a it's an odd show that i think to its credit cribs from some very fun sources you know, it's like, this is a little bit like Indiana Jones. This is a little bit like Back to the Future. This is a little bit like Ghostbusters. This is a little bit like this thing or that thing. So you go, hey, I kind of like those things. And this is sort of like them. And it's like, you know, but I, it hasn't quite gelled as to what it is. And I, I have a feeling it may not. I'm still, I, I, I've i been shocked watching these episodes because it feels like such nostalgia baiting if it was made in like 2022. Yes. But it's like literally happening like years after these movies come out. So it's like, it's still trying to do those things that people like really want to see when they're like hungering for nostalgia. So I, I find it very disorienting to watch this show. (laughs) Yeah. It's, yeah. It's for anyone who, you know, decides to go watch this show in it. Honestly, it does feel almost like, I know you said stranger things. I almost feel almost more like, like an SNL parody. It's almost on that line where you're like, are the clothes this much and the hairs you're like, this much this is their hairstyles and like these are the way they're acting and stuff it's like but it's just it's so in its time it's it becomes this odd 
I, you know, timestamp, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of uh, Continuum Drag. If you have any thoughts or comments, you can get a hold of us at ContinuumDrag at gmail.com. And, of course, on Instagram and Twitter, we'll have some clips from this uh, these two episodes. Mm-hmm. I think I've got uh, those motorbikers. I definitely, uh, I've got, I've got some <laughs> weird stuff. Wouldn't it be great if we only pulled uh, clips of like these like weird, like non sequitur sort of scenes where it's just like, <laughs> all, you're like, what is this show? It's just old dirt bikers and and other like like that guy heckling at a funeral. No, uh, it's it's an odd show for sure. So, but there'll be some good clips from it, and you can find that at Continuum Drag is the handle on those platforms. Um, but other than that, that wraps up for the episode. So, listener, thank you for joining us. And Jordan, I'll see you next week. See you then. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler. Produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.